Daniel Priestley. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? How's your Dubai experience this time? I love coming to Dubai. Dubai is great. It's kind of like a um, real hub of entrepreneurship. There's a lot of entrepreneurial vibes out here, which is great. There's a lot going on, isn't there? And a congratulations are in order because you've just won a scale up of the year with Stephen Oddie yes. uh, at the Great Entrepreneur Awards. In How fairness, Stephen did most of the scalable architecture of the scalable result. Um, <laughs> I just get to go and pick up the award. Amazing. That's the best bit, right? <laughs> I want to start off with a story, a story about you to set the scene from early this year. Don't look so nervous. It's a good story. So early this year, I was sat on a ski lift in Northern Italy with you. And we are amongst 40 other successful entrepreneurs that you had brought together for this incredible experience. And on this ski lift, I said to you, I don't know if you remember this, I'm feel, feeling like an imposter. I think I'm too early in my entrepreneurial journey to be here with this trip. And you said, I've just come from a trip with billionaires. <laughs> yes. And yeah. I felt exactly the same. And what you said next, I've thought about every week okay. since that trip. You said, get comfortable being uncomfortable and get into every room you can. And so my question is, because I thought about that so much, nice. is how has that mentality shaped your entrepreneurial career from that first startup experience to now when you're looking at a hundred million dollar valuation for Score App? Well, I mean, I've always felt a bit out of my depth because I started out, um, you know, at 21, launching my first company. Um, and, you know, we were basically standing in front of audiences and signing up clients and doing deals and, um, you know, pitching big ideas and all of that sort of stuff from 21, 22, 23. You know, by the time I was 23, 24, we were doing a million a month in, mm. uh, in sales. And um, most of the people I dealt with were twice my age at least um, you know, most of the people I was dealing with were 30 years older than me. Um, so yeah, I think it's just something I've had to just get over and, and get on with it. And, um, you know, prove the, the answer is prove yourself, you know, do a great job, <laughs> you yeah. know, use it as fuel. Yeah, exactly. And that's so true. Like if you, if you think that you're in the wrong room, maybe it's just a bit of motivation to say, well, you're not, you've got here somehow and you should push towards making yourself feel like you have value, right? The thing is that Hormozy who says, if you feel like an imposter, why don't you stand on a, on a, you know, a mountain of disproven, just provenable, is that a word? That's not a word. <laughs> value, can, right? We can make it. We'll make it into a word. Stand on that value, yeah. right? Which is, it feels like this is what you instill in what you say. Well, two things. Number one, there's different types of value, right? So being um, young, energetic, um, and a clean slate is actually a type of value. And it's a type of value that people want to have around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I hang out with um, people who are in their 50s, 60s, sometimes 70s, who have made it financially, they love being, you know, in rooms with people who are still making it and still going for it. And they love being around people who've got that spark and that energy and who are bootstrapping and who are like finding ways forward without throwing money at the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so that energy is contagious as well and it adds value to that room. Second thing I'll say, is that there's this principle called environment dictates performance. And that basically means that you're going to perform the way the environment says you should perform. I'll give you an example. When I was early 20s, I discovered Latin jive dancing. And the way I discovered it is I was at a bar getting drunk um, like I would several times a week with my existing friends. And out of nowhere comes this group of three guys and five girls and they, they're doing Latin jive dancing at the club, uh, at this bar. And everyone was just so impressed and they were so great. And, the, you know, the guys are, are dancing with these girls and the girls are looking fabulous and it's all looking great. They come up to the bar and they say, um, and, and I ask them, how did you learn to do that? Like, that's incredible. And they're like, just come to a dance class. So they en enrolled me to go along to the dance class. When I got there, I felt there is no way that I'm ever going to be able to do this and it was so out of my comfort zone because I'd never done any dancing I'd never thought about doing dancing up until that point and then when I saw the instructor show the moves I'm like oh there's no way I will ever be able to do that by the end of one class I was doing it so I was sitting there thinking there's no way I'll get to that point that was just a beginner class and I was doing it at the at the end and what I learned from that experience is that you get into these environments where it becomes normal to do things that look abnormal and you get into environments where people want to dance that that's why they're there 
and it and you're not the weird one you're the weird one if you don't dance mm. right so um so i use that principle with anything i want to do now there are entrepreneur environments where everyone is building a seven or eight figure business that's why they're there that's what dancing is for that group and there are instructors who are making it really simple and saying, hey, you need to hire this type of person. You need to raise this amount of money. And they're just breaking it down into its steps. So a big part of success is getting into the right environment in the first place. And even though uh, one of the ways that you know you're in that right environment is you feel a little bit out of your depth when you arrive. I think that's a great way of looking at it. And that mindset is why I wanted to you know, tell that story and ask that question because it's really, I'm not going to say inspiring for me because it's just... It's something that I think we have to do. We have to overcome. And it's a little bit like putting your ego to one side, isn't it? And being like, I'm happy with being not the best in this room because it's going to bring me forward. And I think, I think that is where your mindset is quite impressive. And I'm quite inspired by it because I read your story. I've listened to your story before. I've, I, I met you before. And there's a similarity, right, in your journey from right at the start. So when I was at uni and I was 18, I uh, was in a lecture hall sat next to my friend who had a, a five-figure business he made in his gap year. And we had this American lecture, lecturer who was quite forthcoming with her opinions. You know, she was very academic and very powerful in, in her spoken word. And he asked like a quite a pertinent and question. American. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> she asked quite a pertinent, he asked a pertinent question and yeah. she was quite, you know, harsh back to him. Mm -hmm. And he ended up saying to her, you know, I've paid for my uni up front. I've got this business. I think I've got more experience in this than you. Wow. And it ended up that she asked him to mentor her wow. to start a business. And I think you've had a similar experience when you were at uni right at the yeah. start, right? You left uni because you, you discovered that the person you were listening to yeah. hadn't actually done what you wanted to do. I was disappointed at uni. I went along, I, I enrolled in this course that was meant to be an entrepreneurial course. It was called mm. Enterprise Management and it was designed to be for startup to small business. And uh, when I got there, there, no, no one had built a proper business and there was one lecturer who um, did swim swimming lessons for about 12 kids uh, in their parents pool and that was a business and then there was another person there who was doing consulting but part of a consulting group and essentially it was just you know selling day rates and that was a business and like that was what we we're being shown and I was like so disappointed and I dropped out as mm -hmm. a result and I went and got a job for an entrepreneur um, and I spent two years from 19 to 21 learning from a, a, a guy who we started a company, we grew it to 6 million of revenue, we had 60 employees, I was employee number three. So I got that whole experience that I wanted, but I got it from a startup as opposed to the university experience. Yeah, isn't that incredible? So my, my question is around when you left, how did your mindset change from what you thought was going to be your journey of success to what actually became your journey to success? Because obviously when you, when you went to uni, you thought this is how I'm going to achieve success. I'm going to learn from this person. Then I'm going to do whatever it was. How did your mindset change to go, actually, I need to find someone in a startup as well, not a, not a corporate? Well, the, the thing was my mindset didn't change. Right? Okay. My mindset was I really want to learn from someone who's done it. And mm. I, want to, I want to learn the theories. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to you know, start at the bottom, but I want to learn how to start a business and I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I was very fixed on that. So when university just didn't match what I had as my mindset, I ditched it. Um, and then it's funny in making that decision, it created the space for exactly what I wanted. So had I tolerated it, I would have gotten stuck, um, you know, in what they had, which most of the people I went to university with, they all ended up in corporate jobs. Mm. Um, they didn't end up starting businesses. So for me, I, um, I made the right decision, but it was actually, I had a very fixed mindset. I, f I was fixed on what I wanted, mm. um, and, uh, and didn't, didn't change much. Very true. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So just to set the scene a bit more. So you grew up in Australia. Yep. You went to university, dropped out, mm -hmm. and then you went to work for a startup. Mm -hmm. And then the next step was that you then created your own startup. Once you've done six million a year, you had that taste at what, 22, 23? 21. 21. Yeah. So then what, what did you, I want to know what your early 20s were like, actually. It's my mm -hmm. question. What were your early 20s like? And what were the best things that you learned to then drive you forward into your late 20s and early 30s? So my early 20s were very intense um, because I went from one startup, which was my mentor's startup, and that was incredibly fast growth. And we went from a beachside town to an inner city Melbourne office very rapidly. Um, 
and it was a lot of training and a lot of being out of comfort zone, a lot of intensity. But the intensity was great. Traveling all the time, um, uh, running events, you know, always being in hotels, uh, turning up to different locations and setting up, you know, the the event, meeting mm. hundreds and hundreds of people every week. So it was a very intense and fast moving environment. And then I set up a similar business. And within year one, we were in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. And like I was 21, 22 and like I'm hiring, you know, these big event venues that are like five grand hire fees and I'm put, you know, running ads in the newspaper that are like 10 grand ads. And I'm doing that in three cities and I'm bouncing between Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and it's like me plus three friends. And we're, one of the things that was interesting, like early 20s was to start my business, I moved back into my family home. Um, but then uh, I had a, like a, a, not a fight, but like a, a, like a disagreement with mum. And she said, this isn't going to work. And right in the middle of startup, I had to find a place, right? So I found this four, I found this perfect place that was a four-story townhouse. And it was this big townhouse, um, really cool place, like crazy expensive. And I had to make a decision. Is this business going to work? Um, in which case we can afford the townhouse. Or like, do I just get a like crappy little apartment and her, like her, then get the townhouse later? I made this crazy decision to just sign on the dotted line and they get, they actually rented us this massive place. And this became the hub for startup uh, the first 12 to 18 months where this became like the party house, it became the workhouse, it became like such an amazing um, thing. And sure enough, the business did take off and we could afford it. Um, so, but it was, it was funny because it was in this kind of like complex, gated complex and everyone just wanted to know what's going on at that house yeah, that. because like people coming and going and like parties all the time and um you know you know what it's like 20 like early 20s just random fun all the time yeah. so there was this intensity of like random fun we had our brisbane crew who would you know come and go from the house but then we'd jump on planes and we'd be down in melbourne doing mm -hmm. stuff and then in sydney doing stuff um and yeah, it was just this insanity. And then that business actually grew from a million in its first year to about 10 million in year three. So, and then we ended up with a massive house um, that was our next place, a seven bedroom, huge house in Brisbane. Um, and, uh, and probably a team of about 20 people. And once again, craziness, everyone was under 30, everyone was single. Um, everyone loved to go out and party in nightclubs. So it was just this insanity of like work hard, play hard. Yeah. But the, I think the moral I took away from that is that you bet on yourself right at the start with signing that thing, that contract. In several right? ways. Yeah. I signed that deal. Um, I ran an ad in the newspaper that was $7,000 on my credit card mm. and I had no way of paying for it um, if it didn't work. Um, I then took a $2,500 venue fee. This is all 20 years ago too, so double those numbers in today's money. Um, $2,500 venue um, so basically I put on a launch event that cost maxed out my credit card. And if I didn't make that launch event work and make sales, um, then the whole thing was going to go kaput. And this is before personal brands, right? This is why you're using ads and stuff. So how did you know how to run the ads in an effective way and make your that was perfect a week? The, the, the startup I'd worked for, we ran lots of ads and I was sure. hands on with those ads. Um, and also we were using personal brands. Okay. So I wasn't the personal brand at that time, but I went and the guy who I brought in was a very highly credible speaker um, and he was a draw card for us running our launch event. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is where I started getting a taste for how powerful a personal brand was. So I spent 10 years working with people who had a personal brand uh, before I even attempted to do one for myself. Yeah. Okay. It makes complete sense. So so then, then you're starting to, to move towards the territory of when you moved to the UK, right? But what I want to ask you or, or touch on really is one of the greatest skills that I think you have is meeting people where they are and communication and letting people understand or in, in simple terms what their issues actually are. Because when you, hear, when you talk or when you read you know, or speak, whatever, you look around, people are nodding. They're like, he's talking to me, that's me. So where did that skill come from? Or where did you understand that you needed to get good at that storytelling marketing? That's sales. Okay. So that's doing hundreds of sales meetings. Um, there's this cool word called entrepreneur and there's an uncool word called salesperson and they're the same person in the beginning. Um, 
So you can call yourself an entrepreneur, but it's really important for most people to know that if your business is going to take off, you're going to be a salesperson. You're going to be selling um, and you've got to sell ideas and you figure out pretty quickly when you do, like when I, when I worked for my mentor, um, one of my jobs was uh, appointment setting. One of my jobs was sa- making sales and doing intense selling after a, an event. Mm. So we would do a campaign and then we'd follow up with every single person who attended our campaign and who engaged with our campaign. And there were days where I would do 12 back-to-back sales meetings where I'd meet someone for breakfast at 7.30 and I'd go through till 7.30, 8.30 at night, pretty much back-to-back with like short breaks for like a um, bite to eat or something like that real quick. And um, and I would do um, sometimes 10 days of that in a row. So I remember there were times where like – I mean, there were crazy. There was actually a couple of crazy weeks where I was driving an hour and a half to go and meet people in the morning at like seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. Then I'd go through till eight thirty, and then I'd drive an hour and a half back to my home. And then I did that like every day for two weeks, and it was exhausting. It was insane and exhausting, but like intense back to back selling sales meetings. Um, and I can't tell you how much I learned about human behavior going through intense sales meetings. So there's something about doing dozens and dozens and dozens of one-to-one sales meetings in a week. Um, it's a rare experience, but it's an incredibly valuable experience. And one of, the, one of the skills that you learn is that you have to meet people where they are and take them on a journey. You can't meet people where you want them to be. Mm. Um, you've got to connect with people in, in their shoes. I think that is really, really interesting. So what, So what is the misconception about sales so everyone wants that pill don't they how can i get better at sales what's the best landing page what's the best hook what do you think a misconception about sales there's a is? lot of misconceptions about sales the first one is that it's a low-end thing to do and the mm. truth is that sales is a high-end thing to do so all high-end brands have sales people the luxury car companies all have sales people the luxury apartments all have sales people um, luxury jewelry and watches all have sales training and sales people. Apple has sales training. Microsoft, Google, they all have sales people and sales training. So if you want to be a premium top end brand, you should embrace the sales process. Uh, strangely, a lot of people think that sales is like a low end thing and it's a high end thing, mm-hmm. right? So that's a big misconception. The other thing that it's people think it's about is pushiness or manipulation or any of that sort of stuff. It's about professionalism. Sales is all about professionalism. It's about taking the time to get to know people, understand what they're looking for and having the knowledge, the product knowledge and the insights to be able to um, communicate the right features, advantages and benefits of what you do to the person so that it fits with what they've expressed is their need or their problem and that you're just helping them to, like if you imagine that a product has five or six key features, advantages, benefits and that they're looking for two or three, it's like making sure that that key fits in that lock mm-hmm. and that they understand this is how you would do, you know, this is how you get what you want. So there's a huge misconception around this, like pushiness or manipulation. It's like, no, no, you're actually just helping people to fast track their understanding of how they get what they want and and having a professional conversation. Um, And then the other thing is that the idea, you know, the idea that sales, one thing that really gets my goat is that every MBA program in the world doesn't have a sales module. Like not, none of them have a sales module. You can't do a, you can't find an MBA program that has sales training. And yet sales is the DNA of every business. So if you like zoom right into what's actually happening in every business, sales are being made. Um, that's what, that's what's going on. Mm. Um, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like saying that you want to build cars but you don't want to understand how an actual engine revolution works. One single revolution. You're like, oh, yeah, it just hums along. It's like, no, no, there's actually a revolution that's happening inside that engine where something is something sparking and firing off and that's driving that piston. And if you don't understand the fundamental of what is happening inside that engine, forget about building a car that's high performance. And it's the same. In a business, the single revolution is the spark of the sale that drives the piston that makes the whole thing go. So understanding sales is so fundamental to understanding why people buy stuff. It's fundamental to creating an offer. It's fundamental to creating marketing that works. It's fundamental to organizing a team that understands how to drive performance. 
So essentially, you know, I think it's just a massive missed opportunity that people have relegated sales to this weird thing, but it's like a very core cool thing. Mm. Do you think that's because marketing has this so much, so much sexier? Everyone it's thinks so much sexier. Yeah, and especially in the US, marketing is massive. The marketing department are almost leading the business, right? When the UK is slightly more reserved, they might have operations as a sort of higher tier. But why do you think that marketing has been pushed forward so much in terms of? You know, we should look at or be led by the analytics of marketing rather than what people are actually buying in some areas. Well, marketing is sexy because it's one to many. Mm-hmm. So you're creating messages that appeal to large groups of people and um, and it's also removed. So, you know, you're doing it through the sexy technology platforms mm-hmm. and you're creating media and you're creating content. And you're trying to create something that goes viral and all of those sorts of things. So marketing departments are going to look cool because they're, up on the grand stage. But the truth is that the marketing department for most of the highest performing companies in the world create opportunities for salespeople to close deals and get deals done. So you might see Alex Homozi on all these platforms getting tens of thousands of views, but I happen to know behind the scenes, they have a very uh, sophisticated and detailed sales engine that turns all those opportunities that are flying around into sales and if you take away that sales team there's really no point in having all these people engaging um engagement's not really very good if you can't turn it into actual transactions i completely agree you see all these memes on on the internet of you know the the sales department looking through the door and seeing the marketing department doing tiktoks and having fun and they're getting really jealous because they're you know they're doing the exciting stuff in the business and it comes to the end of the year and they sort of say who's made the most money and of course goes to the sales or goes to the ops mm. or product or whoever it is. So I can completely understand that. But I think a lot of people earlier in their journeys just completely look at marketing. They just go, I need to just do this. I need to get a bigger audience or people to look at me. And then they have no way of building a list or mm-hmm. making a sale. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's something that perhaps you learn a lot earlier than others. Yeah, in American football, that you've got the quarterback who throws the ball and then you've got someone who, receiver, See, who yeah. catches it and puts the point down. And... Marketing without sales is a little bit like being a quarterback who's just throwing balls out in the out, out, out into space, and there's no one there to catch them and turn that into a point. Um, and that is that's what's going on. And realistically, if you're if I'm starting a business, I'm starting with sales, not marketing. Um, I'm going to get in like one of the things when I launch a new business, I'm doing 30 sales meetings. Like in week one, I want to talk to customers, so we are just going to go through and make cold outreach and say, hey, we're launching a new business, it's a new product, would really love the opportunity to show you our pots and pans, see what you think, um, and, uh, and get your feedback and, and give you an early, early opportunity to buy if it's appropriate. Would you, you know, would you be interested in having a meeting with us? So we're just setting appointments and we're just having meetings before we've done any marketing. Mm. And your marketing, right, this, I've seen you say this, you're marketing for signals first. You want signals of, of intention, right? That's the first thing. Well, when it comes thought. time to do marketing, we're then marketing for signals, okay. which we then in turn into sales appointments. So all of my businesses, I, I've got eight companies, um, they all run on something called a LAPS dashboard. LAPS is weekly leads, appointments, presentations, and sales. So a lead is a signal of interest. That gets turned into an appointment in the diary. A presentation is presenting the value proposition to a customer. And then a sale is they decide to go ahead and or we followed up with them, you know, but a next action towards uh, a completed sale. So where what most people are seeing is the precursor to leads where we're out there generating signals. We're putting content out and all of that sort of stuff. But actually what's making the business run is the leads, appointments, presentations and sales. It's that whole flow effect Um, where I'm starting. So like, for example, tech company score app super successful company, um, technology, product-led growth, people create free accounts and log in and all that. That's where we are today. Three years ago, you would have seen me in a boardroom sitting down face-to-face with a one customer at a time with a laptop, showing them a presentation and seeing if we could talk to them about how a scorecard would help their business. I did, I probably have done 150 one-to-one meetings personally to get, to get totally inside the customer's shoes to understand exactly what are the things that make people want to buy this product? What are the things that, what are the problems they're trying to solve? How do they describe those problems? What language do they use? Um, when they talk about their goals or their dreams or their expectations, 
what language do they use for that? So I'm doing personally as a founder and a CEO and as a, someone who doesn't need it need to do it financially. I am totally getting hands hands dirty on sales meetings. Um, now where we are today is we don't have to do any of that. We can do product led growth. Um, we have a customer success team and we do onboarding. Totally different model. But the reason, the only reason that that works is because of how we did one to one sales in the early days. And even before you put any money into it, you're therefore then speaking to the people. I saw you said this is it's still related on the on Ali Abdul's podcast. Uh, you spoke to him about you know, the most followed productivity guy in the world. And he, you know, I think you were talking about a productivity app that he could launch. And he was talking about you could do an MVP and you could do this. And you said, why don't you get a spreadsheet of what you would do, send it to someone and then ring them and say, have you done it today? Mm-hmm. And he was like, wow, OK, <laughs> like he wants to make something kind of shiny like everyone does. Yeah. And you're like, no. Literally yeah. ask someone if that's a good idea, if it solves a problem, and then build, build something that's almost non-existent and make it work, over-deliver. Yeah, get, get the best entrepreneurs I know, they get hands really dirty. So if they want to create an app, it's like fundamentally, what does that app do? Okay, if there's productivity. So I'm just going to call you three times throughout the day, find out what have you, what have you done that has been productive and how did that happen? What have you done that you haven't done that you're disappointed about and what would have perhaps helped And I'm just going to have a call, like something as stupid as that. Mm. Um, We might have a shared ClickUp notes that we might use, like an existing piece of software. And what I'm trying to figure out is like, is there something that needs to exist and would a customer use it? Um, And then the next phase that for me I would do is I would cut out, physically cut out little iPhone cardboard pieces of like white card And then I would draw um, as best I could the buttons and what I think it would look like. And then I'd sit down with customers and go, okay, so imagine this, you click on this, right? And then this appears and then this happens and then this drop down menu happens and then you add this in and then this happens, right? And I would literally have my little playing cards of hand-drawn buttons and like designs. And then I'd ask the customer like, how's that going for you so far? Would you use that? Oh no, I probably would have not used it so far okay what what needs to change well it would just have to kind of automatically sync with my calendar ah okay so imagine that it does that yeah. i write on the back of that little card auto auto sync with calendar right so I put that off to the side so then we go through and i'm just doing those sorts of silly things long before i'm sitting down and doing tech it sounds silly but it's not silly is it so i'm going to speak now for entrepreneurs who are earlier in their their development because i've been exactly this kind of person right and they're going to hear you get say all this and go but but how am i going to get in front of someone how am i going to i haven't got an audience i don't even know what my audience wants so this is where i want to talk to you about personal branding Mm -hmm. right so in the summer i was in london and i sat down with sam winsbury who you know and owns a really cool personal branding agency and we had a podcast and he referred to you as the godfather of personal branding which i think is pretty cool that's pretty know. cool yeah um and my question for you i want to talk to you about is personal branding is massive right now it's always been massive but mm-hmm. right now it's a big thing in the media gary Vee is talking about it you wrote a book about it in 2009 mm. so what has changed between 2009 and now and obviously the people that have you've helped build personal brands or build businesses and obviously that book has been rewritten in different ways and you've spoken in different ways it's very relevant still but what have you seen change between then and now in that sort of decade and a bit? Well, a lot has changed. Um, when I wrote the book, it was a radical idea. It was like a weird thing to do. Um, and there was no way you could get buy-in from like a serious business person who would go, oh, yeah, I should have a personal brand or any of that sort of stuff. Um, it was pretty radical at the time just to have a LinkedIn profile. And, you know, it was considered to be cutting edge to be on Twitter. <laughs> um, so like anyone who was on Twitter and had LinkedIn was like leading the pack type thing. Um, so obviously the standards have gone right up. You know, people people like have seen it before and they've expected it and it's also very noisy and it's competitive. It's gone from a nice to have to a must have. So I think almost every single business that wants to take off at the moment has to have a minimum standard of personal brand attached um so there's a lot more sophistication in understanding how it all works uh with that said it's still relatively early there are still plenty of people out there who don't have a personal brand and aren't thinking about it 
um, you know, mm. <laughs> like um, the other thing too is that there are, the, the world has now organized into um, lists. So one thing that didn't exist when I wrote the book is that let's say you wanted to sell a productivity app. There were no groups on Facebook about productivity. There were no channels that existed about productivity. Whereas today, if you want to start something, you could easily within half a day find the top 25 influencers in the world who are in that space. You could rank them according to you know how, intense they are f- how intensely they're followed and all those sorts of things. So within a half a day, you've got a lay of the land of all the people you could partner with. You've got you know a global audience size. You've got a total addressable market. You can just find that stuff out. Plus now add, add to that AI, mm-hmm. you know, like within the other half of the day, you've written the business plan, you've done a financial forecast, you've, you know, you've come up with 27 different product ideas and landing pages for them all. You've come up with an entire advertising schedule. You've written letters, AI generated letters to the CFO of different companies to see if we can, you know, organize some sort of, you know, early stage investment, you know, all sorts of stuff. So, so we're just in a, a market that now moves way faster that it's possible to move way faster don't hear saturated and don't hear competitive and think oh it's over think oh wow i could probably do it 10 times faster Mm. yeah that's a great way to look at it isn't it because uh, yeah i think i think although it's been going a while i think it's a great time to get on different platforms especially places like linkedin where organic growth is is massive yeah um and on the other side of that, so you've got personal brand and you've got a business already and you've got a personal brand. On the other side of that, we're also seeing the rise of creators, not, not influencers, creators who have a business idea or they're growing a business at the same time, but they're accelerating so much faster because they can grow an audience that mm-hmm. is related to what they're doing mm-hmm. so quickly. But my question is going to be around how to monetize that. So a lot of people are growing a following based around an idea that, you know, a business idea, and it could be anything. Mm-hmm. How do you then monetize that quickly? And I think you it might relate back to what you just said, which is you know, marketing for signals using um, different technologies. How how can someone do that? How can you monetize your, your following? Yeah, so what we need to do is have some sort of a bridge from the audience to a lead. So we need to be able to, let's say we've got an audience, an audience of people who are paying attention. So if we think about an audience at a concert are the people who are looking at the stage and they're paying attention. Um, if we were to say to that audience, put your hand up if you would like to buy some merch, mm. right? Now they've given you a signal that they're interested in buying some merch, right? Oh, that would be weird, but anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. But you get an audience to signal intent. So one of the next steps from having an audience is a signaling campaign of signal your interest if. Um, so let us know, we're looking at launching a productivity app, we're looking at launching a thing, mm. um, let us know if you'd be interested. Join the waiting list, join the registration, fill in the scorecard. Um, so anything like that. So let's say you're a fitness influencer and you might say, um, I'm looking at creating a, an online program for people who want to run their first marathon. Let me know if you would like to run your first marathon this year by taking the marathon readiness scorecard. Um, you know, something like that. That would be, that's, that's that first bridge of signal campaign. And then the next part is what most people hate, which is you need to contact people one to one. You need to actually like, how does money happen? Money either happen, money happens through products and services, and products and services are either so cheap that people don't have to think hard about buying them, which means you have to sell a lot of these in order to make any money, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say you come up with something that's ten bucks, twenty bucks, thirty bucks, forty bucks. Um, well, now you have to have thousands and thousands of sales every month just to pay basic bills Um, or it's going to be more expensive which means you don't need so many people but people don't buy stuff that's expensive without talking to someone first so you're in you you now have a conundrum and the conundrum is do i try and this month do i try and sell uh, a thousand things at 40 bucks or five things at a thousand bucks right somewhere somewhere like that that you know so essentially um what most people do is they try and avoid selling so they try and sell a cheap thing um and because they're selling a cheap thing you need massive volumes and people underestimate they massively underestimate how hard it is to get a thousand people to do something you might need you might need fifty thousand engaged audience to get a thousand people to do something that's cheap um so and then they'll do it once 
what are you going to do next month? And the month after that, the month after that. So, um, so that's, that's the fool's errand. That is the shiny path that is actually way harder. The dangerous looking path that is way easier is get five people to do something for a thousand a month and sign up for 12 months. And you only need a tiny percentage of people who are interested in that. And now you've covered your basic expenses every month for the next 12 months. And that's the thing that I think so many people fall into, especially those who, like you just said, are building that audience first and they haven't maybe shown their value yet. And they go, I can just sell something so cheap. And if I sell a hundred of them a month, I'll be able to pay my rent. And if you have that like full of remarkable solution, which is what you always talk about, you can then go, here's a thousand or here's 5,000 as a one-off. And then you can actually deliver and you can actually get testimonials and you can actually drive mm -hmm. your business forward, right? It's a different way of approaching it. So I wanted to touch on um, something that Stephen Bartlett is doing, right? So mm -hmm. in his diary of a CEO uh, team, they are using a lot of data. So they're doing over 100 tests per piece of content that goes out to make sure it's engaging and you know, yep. it gets the most return on investment that you could possibly get. But whenever I hear him say that, I think, okay, I've got a podcast. I should be testing stuff. I can't do 100 bits of content with just our little team to be able to get the most engagement, although we try. But what I wanted to ask was, for people that don't have a means to do that kind of work with a big team, what's the best way to gather signals for your offerings? So I really want to touch on, you know, um, using quizzes, using some sort of software and how that then works. So let's just start with the whole Stephen Bartlett thing because I think a lot of people get intimidated by hearing those sorts of things. And the same, Mr. B says the same thing. Mm. So more, like what they're describing is that when they're like thumbnails, for example, they'll actually run a hundred um, different variations of ads on Facebook and they'll run a 50 pound budget to each of them and then they'll see how many people click to basically measure the highest returning thumbnail and then they'll use that thumbnail when they launch that video. Um, and yeah, so it might cost five grand to do the testing. And you think to yourself, well, most people don't have five grand. But you've got to remember that, you know, a Formula One driver was once a go-kart driver. And then they got into like Formula Three and then they got put into different leagues and then they, got, you know, got training and development. But the overheads go high. You've got more team. So you have to be that good. So when you hear Stephen Bartlett, you know, he's probably spending 100 grand a month on these sorts of things. So he, he has to be a Formula One driver yeah. in order to pay for the team. So he's, he, you know, it's it's not like, oh, you've made it. It's like, no, no, you're dealing with a really high, high quality problem and you've got to be the best of the best of the best. But when you're starting out, you don't have very many overheads. So even if you tested three things and out of three, you, you figure out that this one's the best of three, that's probably enough to pay your overheads in the early days because... You don't have a big team or big yeah. overheads. Um, one of the most effective things we found that you, you alluded to kindly is um, the scorecard, right? So the scorecard, when I was launching my personal brand and I wanted to make more sales, I launched this thing called the Key Person of Influence Scorecard, which accompanied the book. And it really took off. 90,000 people filled it in. Those leads went to the sales team. Each lead had uh, 40 pieces of information about the person so once someone had filled in that scorecard, it was really easy to have a good sales conversation and to talk to people. So I was able to build a very successful global sales team off the back of it. We did tens of millions of sales. Um, and it was really, we, we got a repeatable formula, which was we give away the books. Uh, inside the book was a bookmark saying, take the scorecard before you start the book. Um, so you get the most out of the book. And then people would take the scorecard. The scorecard would give them value, but it also gives us the data that we need to have a sensible conversation. And then we'd have a conversation, make a sale. And, and we've just got into the habit of doing that hundreds of times every week. Um, and it became, you know, global business, tens of millions. So a lot of people started going, how do we do these scorecards? This is really cool. So what we ended up doing is creating this, the platform to make it super easy. When I built my first three scorecards, each one cost about eight to 12,000 and wow. about six weeks worth of work to get it done. And now that we have AI plugged into it, that it takes about six minutes. You answer a few questions that the AI asks you, it then spits out a landing page, data capture forms, questionnaire, dynamic content, and it's pretty much ready for you to put finishing touches on within five or six minutes. Um, it's wild. 
Um, and we do that off the back of a free account. So you can try yeah. that out with a free account and, and see how it works for you. Um, and you've done that on a stage before as well. I've seen you do it on a stage in like five minutes. Literally create a, create a campaign and let AI do all the work yeah. in five minutes. And then the audience fills it in off a QR code. And then the AI is writing email campaigns and all that sort of yeah. stuff. So it's really, it's really wild. Um, but essentially, if you've got an audience of any size, even if it's a small audience, this is the, the thing to start early is give people that thing that they can then fill in so you get a signal of interest that you can have a sales conversation, get the insights and make a sale. Mm -hmm. And what's like, what is crazy about that is that, I mean, we've got your books here, we've got all the books here and we'll be giving these away, by the way, to a listener um, sign. So you can, we'll do a poll underneath this episode. Um, what is wild is that it is so quick and it's so useful and you're giving value to your, um, your prospective customer, but also you are able to gather so much information. You also touched on the books. We touched on the books here. These are, there's five books, right? And they are not here, but you've written five books. Yeah. They are in the top business books that I've read, all of them, which is actually quite standing, really, isn't it? Not to, not to you, but like in general, the amount of business books out there, they, like I said earlier, they relate so closely to so many problems. Do you think that writing books still has the gravitas that it used to have? Because, only because a lot of people that we speak to would love to write a book but they haven't got the time or they say they haven't got the time. Mm. So is that return on investment still there and how can they write a book quicker? Mm. So AI has come along and it's creating all this content. Um, but isn't it interesting that the people who are the closest to AI, some of the top AI thought leaders in the world are all writing books at the moment about their thought leadership on AI. Um, so you're talking about like some of the best AI founders are all putting books out this year. There's something very powerful about having a book out that is a thought leadership book. So what will disappear is the basic um, recipe book or the textbook because all of that will be a combination of Google and AI. But what we need or what people want is punchy, like shorter is better now mm -hmm. because people can go deep. It used to be that the book had to have everything and it had to be 100,000 words because there was no Google or mm. AI around it. Now a book can be 30,000 words, um, but focused on thought leadership. So the, book that, the books that are going to be valued are the ones that really sort of tell people, they build an argument for something that's happening. Mm. So that's the, that's the kind of book. They're, they're trend-setting books. They're telling people to do something different. They're saying, hey, look, you, you, you think that you should start with finances and money and products, but you should start with why. What's the purpose of your business? Simon Sinek. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. So it tells you, don't do this, do this. So that's a thought leadership book. Um, you think that you need to do, um, you know, this, uh, you know, this MBA stuff, but actually, you need to do a lean startup. This is how you do a lean startup. So it's like, don't do this, do this. So you, these books are thought leadership books, and they're really, really powerful. Their job is to build an argument. So you're you're trying to you're trying to argue for something. So you might do a book called The Healthy Entrepreneur, and it's all about prioritizing health with entrepreneurship and actually recontextualizing what being a healthy entrepreneur is and how to be that. So it's steering people towards a path. So think about if you're gonna write a book, the purpose of that book should be to steer someone towards a path that you think that they should go on and you're explaining how to go down that path and what would be the benefits and you're kind of building that case. Um, now, the reason that people don't have time to do a book is they don't understand how books give you massive amounts of time back and how they massively elevate your value. I used to, before being an author, I used to have hundreds of first meetings with people. So a first meeting in a sales context is a, is a meeting where you don't intend to make a sale. You're just building rapport, you're just meeting someone. And these can be endless. These can be massively like time consuming things. So especially if you're doing sophisticated sales with corporate or you're selling into channels, where the first meeting is just kind of lay of the land, touching base, getting to know someone, having a coffee. My goodness, these things take up huge amounts of time and you always buy someone coffee or lunch or dinner mm. or this, that, the other, um, and you bring materials. By the time you actually do that, it's expensive, time consuming. When I wrote a book, I went, oh, wait a second, I can just send someone a book. And then if I send out a thousand books, I do more good with a thousand books than meeting a thousand people for a cup of coffee and it's cheaper than the cup of cups of coffee. Yeah. 
So I see the book not as a book. I see it as a first meeting, right? So it's their first meeting at scale. Um, and my goal when I do books is that I don't really care whether I sell any. I care about how many I give away. So I'm not measuring book sales. Don't mm. care. I measure book giveaways. Mm. When I sponsor an event, um, I sponsor the event on the condition that they put a book in everyone's goodie bag. Um, you know, when I run a campaign, we often will send out books. Uh, we printed 10,000 scorecard marketing books when that launched and I gave away 10,000 copies and it turned into 50,000 pounds a month worth of recurring revenue and 6 million worth of enterprise value. Wow. Right. So I wrote a book and yeah. What right? ad can do that as well. Right? Exactly. And, and, and now I get asked to speak on scorecard marketing and I get referred to as the creator of scorecard marketing and I'm an authority in the space and all of that sort of stuff. So all of these benefits start stacking. But just very tangibly, 10,000 books given away, 50,000 a month worth of recurring revenue, 6 million worth of enterprise value mm -hmm. that I can track straight back to the launch of that book. Um, and then that's not the long-term value of that. That's just giving away 10,000 copies. How much does it cost? Well, it cost about three pounds of giveaway. So, because we did 10,000 copies, you get a lot mm. cheaper when you print 10,000 copies. So to land one on a desk was about three pounds. So 30,000 pounds for six million. Yeah, but the returns are real. That's ridiculous, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. It's like, so, okay, so if there's anyone listening that is intimidated by that, yeah. because they're like, I, I, maybe I've got a book, but I don't want to relaunch it. Or I don't yeah. want to write another one, I'm, whatever. Give, effectively, what you've done there is you've given away free value on an authoritative topic, mm -hmm. which you can do in other places, right? A book is probably the best return, like you say, is the first meeting. If you do it on LinkedIn, it's not as powerful, but it's still a stepping stone. Like we said, we're talking about Formula One drivers, Formula Three drivers. As a Formula Three driver, you can still give away value online for free before you get to the Formula One of doing the book. Of doing the book, yeah. right? Or so even we, talks. Or we've speak. also found that AI, what most people think AI is going to do when it relates to books is they think AI is going to write books. Truth is, AI is going to be an amazing research assistant. Mm -hmm. So we've just created a piece of software called bookmagic.ai. And bookmagic.ai is for anyone who wants to write a book, the AI creates a reader avatar it generates 30 or 40 questions as to what that reader would be thinking and wanting to know. It then structures that into a set of chapters. It then tells you here's research that will help you make your points, like it actually points to the research. It then comes up with a set of analogies and says you could use an analogy like a plane flying and you know falling through the air or you could use an analogy like someone who's trying to ride a bike for the first time. Or you could. So it spits out analogies that you might want to use um, so it also finds case studies in the public domain and says, oh, this is like wow. when Microsoft did this acquisition and this is like when this happened. So it, it starts doing all the research. Uh, now, you still write the book, mm. but now you have what a top author like Mac Malcolm Gladwell would be spending 50 to 150 grand a year on research assisting, yeah. right? You now have that for you know, a few, few bucks a month. So you now have this research assistant who's helping you to write the book. Now, AI is not writing it for you, yeah. but AI is just supporting that whole process. Which is really interesting. That's what I want to touch on, really, because it was about this time last year that OpenAI released ChatGPT mm -hmm. to the world. And over the Christmas period, the festive, festive period, you had webinars mm -hmm. with yeah. hundreds, yeah. literally 500 per webinar, talking about AI. And you had just learned the same information, but you put more effort in. And therefore, you were able to say, this is what I've learned. This is how we're going to use it. And people were listening. Mm -hmm. So you become an authority in that space. How, is, how has AI changed? Big question. From, the last, uh, from 2020, end of 2022 to the end of 2023. Yeah, so it's massive change. I, I got onto OpenAI um, the year before, two years before. Okay. I, I started writing about it for entrepreneur.com, I think in 2021. Okay. Um, and I was talking about generative AI in some of my books in the teens, but it was all just like pie in the sky and this is coming one day in the mm. future. And then bang, 2022, it's there. And then it, and it leveled up and then it just continued to level up and level up. So what we're seeing with ChatGPT4 is actually a couple of years old. And what is happening that's causing ruffling a lot of feathers now is things like QSTAR, which is the new versions. And these new versions are multimodal, 
they take huge amounts of information and condense it. So you can put tens of thousands of words into it and then say summarize this into a few sentences and it will mm. and you can show it a photo and say where in the world is this um, I, I showed it a photo of an ad i uploaded a, just an image of an ad and i said write the landing page that this ad points people to and it wrote this landing page then i said write a business plan for that landing page that the business makes money off that product and service come up with other complementary products and services Within about three or four prompts, I showed that you could go from just having one ad to a landing page to an entire product ecosystem to an entire business plan to an acquisition or exit strategy. And I literally did that in about 15 minutes with, with de as a demo and showed that the slightest, tiniest little seed turns into a forest mm. within minutes. And if you're not using this, you're just going to be walloped by people who are. Um, but look, here's, here's the biggest thing. The biggest thing is, let's just zoom right out to the le level of principles. The biggest thing you need to know about AI is that it has two superpowers. Superpower number one is that it is going to capture your attention and hold your attention for much longer than you intended. It's going to distract you and entertain you and it's going to get you to run down rabbit holes. Even if you think, oh, but I don't want to be entertained, I want to be educated because that feels more, it'll just figure that out and it'll just run you down a rabbit hole right it's going to figure you out like a master chess player and it's going to run rings around you and hold your attention to get you to consume more stuff right so ai is really good at getting you to consume on spotify you want to listen to one song it's going to get you to listen to five right mm. you want to listen to you want to watch one video it's going to get you to listen watch 10 videos you go on tiktok for five minutes it's going to keep you there for 50 minutes mm. so AI is working behind the scenes to get you to consume, consume, consume. The second superpower is the creativity. It's going to take the tiniest bit of creativity and help you to create, 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 create. But the population are going to divide into. What's going to happen is that the population is going to be 95% of people who are over consuming and their life gets completely eaten up and wasted and a year goes by and that they've, you know, they've not created anything so they're basically falling behind and then 10 years go by and they're just basically siloed off into this little consumption bubble. And then on the other side, you're going to get these hyper creators who are going to create, create, create. And you're going to have a team of 10 creators who are doing tens of millions of revenue because they're just pumping stuff out with AI. Right now is the moment you've got to make a, a conscious decision while you still can that you're going to be a creator, not a consumer. That you're going to delete the apps off your phone. You're not going to engage with the AI because it's better than you. It's smarter than you. It's got, only got one job and it'll do that job really, really well. So you're going to be super aware that AI is trying to get you to consume. You're going to wall that away and you're going to focus on how do I use AI to create stuff. And you're going to make that decision to be on that side of the wedge, not that side of the wedge. Because this is, this is going to get real good real fast and it's going to divide society real fast. Well, I think that is probably the best thing we can leave it on. That's a bit of a real nugget of value. Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. What a pleasure. Cheers.